So as director of the Institute um, of Social Inquiry, Critical Social Inquiry, it's, um, it, this is the third year of its realization. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the third and the last of the public lectures um, in the Institute series that comes in the middle of what has been a grueling, exhilarating, and as I promised, an exhausting week of master classes by professors David Harvey on Marx, Anthony Appiah on Du Bois, and Michael Tausick on Walter Benjamin. And it's my added pleasure to introduce Michael Tausick, whose incandescent work has transformed, really, really transformed what ethnography is and what it takes to do it. When I was a newly, this is a little personal, when I was a newly minted uh, tenured professor at the University of Michigan, in 1989, and I had just arrived there to join the making of a doctoral program in anthropology and history, I found myself in an office with filing cabinets that had Tausick scrawled across its side panels. When I first arrived at the New School for Social Research from Michigan in 2004, I found a picture of the young Hannah Arendt adorning my empty desk. Both felt like an omen and an invitation, and I'm not sure which one was better. Mick Tausick trained first as a doctor, as many of you know, became a professor of anthropology at the University of Michigan, left there, went to the School of Performance Arts, is that, is that the proper name at NYU, then on to Columbia, um, was barely, and still is a decade, my senior. But his work on the culture of terror and the Punta Mayo and the critiques he lodged against a flat-footed Marxism that could not acknowledge how much the magic of commodity fetishism permeated our lives was a beacon of a sort. His appreciation of the epistemic murk, citing Mikdausik, the hallucinatory quality of power in the state itself captured for me as a fledging doctoral student what colonial power looked like the gossamer quality of violences and the death and mutilations strewn in its wake. Epistemic murk appeared so often in my writing, Mick doesn't know this, that some readers thought it was mine. Um, but it captured something that eluded so many others writing on colonialism at the time a form of governance in which hierarchies of credibility were turned on their heads, where rumors and hearsay were endowed with more than what was a visually witnessed fact, where a common sense was crafted that policed what everyone knew, those public secrets that one need not say or that could not yet be articulated or were too dangerous to express. What drew me and I think so many other generations of anthropologists, philosophers, artists, historians, art critics to his work is his refusal to imagine that the real is something that you can only step in. People love to celebrate his wild style of teaching, what the New York Times once called his gonzo anthropology. But one should not be deceived by this seemingly impromptu performative quality. These are not superficial embellishments, but the substance of his practice. To treat them otherwise, I think, is to miss the meticulous reading, the enormous erudition and its range, an insatiable curiosity that's never confined to the boundaries of what knowing and experience can be. His is a thinking that comes with projects for which a conventional order is resisted, a conventional style of thinking is refused, and a conventional style of writing is condemned. One could say almost single-handedly, before the writing culture moment in the mid-1980s, Mittausik made the aesthetics of ethnography and the aesthetics of politics and the pornography of political violence center stage. Far before many of us had read Jacques Rancière on the distribution and division of the senses, le partage de sensibles, as a key feature of how governance operates. He did more than introduce Benjamin 
and the power of the mimetic faculty to a field that had been so dry of play and the playfulness of object turned subject, subject turned object, of the vacillations in how we know and what kind of experiences make us know viscerally and better. He kaleidoscopes sensibilities and sensory regimes and makes them the substance of his texts, disallowing any notion that we are sanctioned to retreat to the safety nets of social science. If there is a question, as Walter Benjamin posed, as to whether, it's something we talked about this morning, the mimetic faculty has been destroyed on our cultural and political shared landscapes, McTausick's relationship to Walter Benjamin's projects might suggest otherwise, that it is not. His writings from The Devil and Commodity Fetishism, 1980, Shamanism, Colonial and, and the Wild Man, 87, Nervous System, 92, Mimesis and Alterity, 93, The Magic of the State, 1997, My Cocaine Museum, 2006, Beauty and the Beast, 2012, I won't name all of them. To name a few, attest to a virtual embodiment, I think, of Benjamin's practices and perspicacities. In Tausig's hands, they are the same and dissimilar infused with our present and decidedly his own, bristling constantly against what he calls representational security. He hovers in a space that refuses that comfort as he charges us to suspend ourselves in that crepuscular space of awakening to a political future that is not yet ours. So please join me in welcoming Mick Tausick, who invites us this evening to consider Rastelli the jungle, Juggler, or What Are the Turks Doing, and Walter Benjamin's thesis on history and in the bodily unconscious, or at least that was his title yesterday. <laughs> we should be neither surprised nor alarmed if it is not his title and subject today. Nick, thank you. Thank you. Great. Oh. Let's get my little talisman. What a great introduction. I, I hope I can live up to one tenth of it. Uh, um, it's, it's really, um, well, it's just so absorbing to see one's uh, life's work condensed in that, in that form, and I thank you for that very much. Um, I uh, have called this uh, talk The Cry of the Donkey. Uh, <clears throat> as of this writing, my artist colleague, Simran Gill, is becoming a palm oil tree on the streets of Malacca. Next step, biodiesel. This is big news, or is it? Such metamorphoses from human to tree or tree to human are maybe not that miraculous this day and age. Something strange is afoot, all mixed up and confusing. Used to be like the Cold War, us here, them there, subjects knew their place, and as for objects, they were meek and would never dare trespass. But now, objects, you have nothing to lose but your chains. Palm oil is already in half the packaged goods in your supermarket. By 2020, world production of it will double from what it was in 2000. Not only Simran, but you and I are becoming palm trees. Like the human stem cell capable of spawning all cells, palm oil is an elixir a magical substance from which all manner of being emerges, the metamorphic sublime, an alchemist's dream, finally. To think that the peninsula of Malaya, Malaya was one of the world's cornucopias of animal, bird, and plant life. But today, where has all that bio gone? Not to worry, things tell stories too. And how much more is this the case with our supernatural palm of the metamorphic sublime, as you shall hear in the pages that follow? I see Simran, or what was her, 
now bedecked in a flurry of palm leaves like giant ostrich feathers. A blur, the head is gone. Oh, oh, here she is again, clutching a bunch of African palm nuts to her midriff as if she is pregnant. And why not? Stranger hybrids have happened, especially when you live by a palm plantation, as does she. The animals may have departed, others have taken their place. For example, there are the morbid pig pens, low and dark, where all the pigs died recently. All, end of that little experiment. And now there are the strange houses, if that's the term. Some are 100 feet high. They have no windows, but tiny portholes. These are the bird hotels, as Simran calls them built throughout the plantation in the hope that the birds will come and nest inside. And at the end of the year, some poor Bangladeshi temporary migrant will have to get in there, which truly boggles the imagination, crawling around in that fetid darkness, and take out the nests from which the birds' nest soup shall be made of the mucus and whatever else that holds the feathers and twigs together. A blur, the head has gone, the forest has gone, and the animals, where have they gone? Cut-ups. But of course, writes William Burroughs in defense of his and Brian Geisen's cut-up method. I have been a cut-up for years, and why not? Words know where they belong better than you do. I think of words as being alive, like animals. They don't like to be kept in pages. Cut the pages and let the words out. Here we go. Late at night in the village in northern Colombia, I would hear a donkey bray. Such a strange word, bray, right outside my window, like a giant with an asthmatic attack, vomiting its heart out. The air seems to get sucked in with a rasping sound as if the, as if the donkey was swallowing an African palm tree, fronds, thorns, and all, followed by a gurgling and a rumbling and then this terrible vomiting, as if everything we need is, is being torn out, guts and all, in an explosion turning the universe inside out. It was thunder, not out there, but in my soul, in the black of night, sometimes another donkey far away would bray in response. <laughs> turning the world inside out in sonic delirium. In the darkness of the night, this animal cry out of nowhere opened up a swath of my mises. Was this a love song or a declaration of war, or both, as young Michael and Donya Edith insisted? The pain in that sound was too much for me to bear. No wonder Plato goes to such lengths as to warn against imitating horses neighing. And if he was so uptight about a mere horse, one can only imagine his horror at the thought that the future guardians of his more than perfect republic would dare mimic a donkey. Language would give up the ghost, logic would disappear, and the republic would fall just like I hear it crashing to the ground outside my window. Is this why the cry of the donkey shivers the soul? Actually, despite his critique of mimesis in other texts, in, in other texts, Plato here adheres to the magical view of mimesis, that in imitating something, I can or will become that thing. That in imitating something, I will can or will become that thing. He cannot put it baldly like this, since that would be to admit to the truth and the reality of the magic of the mimetic faculty. Like British administrators in colonial Africa, he is caught in a bind. To outlaw magic is to admit to its presence and even efficacy. Plato is not alone here. The history of the West is the history of the repression of mimesis along with and tied to the domination of nature. Mimesis, along with its embodiments in poetry, myth, and storytelling, is dangerous. Far from being set aside because it is inferior or distasteful or just plain silly, mimesis is to be actively repressed on account of that power. This certainly touches a nerve, and that nerve is the magic of the state. For does not the state, in the majesty of its law, generate, generate immense aura? As for the giddiness of chasing copies of copies of the real, 
mimesis, mimesis. This is the dilemma well known to shamans, among whom we could promote Plato himself. In a word, mimesis is dangerous, and the strangeness of Plato's examples of really dangerous mimesis are testimony not only to the danger of the mimetic faculty, but to its attraction. And what better symbol of all that is held, what, what better symbol of all that is held to be wrong-headed and stupid with mimesis than the cry of the donkey? I believe Deleuze and Guattari would regard the crying of the donkey as a sound accessing what they call the plane of imminence. Indeed, such a sound has express track status in this regard because it is a sound like chalk scraping the blackboard that takes the human body out of itself. But what is this plane of imminence? It is not so much a, a place or a thing or a surface as it is a network of metamorphoses and anamorphoses that D and G regard as, quote, becomings, very much including becoming animal. And furthermore, it would be quite wrong to think of the plane of, uh, as, as one thing and the metamorphoses of becomings as another. Instead, the plane is itself constituted by these becomings, such that impulsions running wave-like through the bodily unconscious might be a better phrasing or offer a better picture of this plane. Understanding bodily here as referring to my body, your body, and the body of the world. A brief interlude. This is the body also of the sorcerer, the sorcerer intuits, which we can all learn from, noting that D and G make considerable use of the sorcerer in their discussion of the plane of imminence. Example, stones walk across the desert, the stones sing, Sorcerers listen. They learn the song, the whitefish song, for example. They sing it to kill a person living in the north by the sea. The tides go out a long way there. As the moon waxes and wanes, so the tides go out and come in further and further. And as they do so, the stomach of the victim expands and contracts until after some weeks the person dies. My body, your body, and the body of the world. This very story not only moves along the plane of imminence, but constitutes it as well. Like the chalk walking across the blackboard, and like the cry of the donkey. All this singing. But is there not something a little off with my phrasing here? For it's not so much a question of the cry of the donkey accessing the plane of imminence, nor of its constituting a foresaid plane, but that the latter itself is overthrown as in shock. Yes, that's it. Not even the plane of imminence can stand up to this sound. It is as if the very plane of imminence turns on itself, which is pretty much Walter B. Cannon's idea of what happened to the body in shock due to massive blood loss in the trenches in World War I as what he called the autonomic, the automatic, the autonomic nervous system, meaning the bodily unconscious, meant to protect the body, is also what kills it as it reaches and bypasses the extremes of autoregulation. Hence, the cry of the donkey is just such a shock, a reset of the plane of imminence, a flushing out of sound and the mimetic potential therein, potentials therein. Such bodily impulsion refers me to mana, M-A-N-A, -A, the magic behind magic, as delineated by the French uh, anthropologist Henri Hubert and Marcel Mauss in their General Theory of Magic book, 1902. Mana, M-A-N-A, -A, being for them a way of contesting intellectualist theories of magic based on the utilitarian logic of the individual as famously advanced 
by Fraser in The Golden Bough. Borrowing the term manna from the indigenous people of the South Pacific via the missionary and anthropologist R. H. Codrington, Hubert and Maus were at pains not to follow the conscious thought of the calculating individual, we all know that homo economicus character, but the unconscious thought of the collective, which I myself understand to include a whole lot more than people, given where the village is, given where this field work takes place, it includes a lot more than people. Animals, for instance, plants, for instance, swamps, for instance, and rivers are in there too, in that collectivity with its unconscious thought. For me, manna is the magic of magic that lies behind what Walter Benjamin called the mimetic faculty and, not, and, what he, and, and nonsensuous similarities. Non-sensual similarities, it's, it's part of uh, the mimetic faculty, you might say. This term, non sensual similarities, was a dodgy move on Benjamin's part. He wished to preserve the exactness of mimesis and its associated thrill, while acknowledging the fact that most correspondences, a la Baudelaire, did not, certainly not at first sight, match up on a one-to-one -one imitation or embrace a physical, visceral connection. In fact, Benjamin made his dodgy move more as a hypothesis and method for investigation of the mimetic workings of language. Behind this was his tinkering with the origins of written language in magical practices. Origin of written languages coming out of magical practices. Like my colleague in crime, the artist Simran Gill becoming a palm tree in Port Dixon, Malaysia. The child being a windmill by standing tall and waving outstretched arms, and my artist friend Simran Gill becoming a palm tree are fine instances of a one-to-one -one mimesis. But the mimetic connection gets a lot trickier with palm reading Divination using the cracks in a burnt caribou scapula, reading a person's character from their handwriting, and let's not forget with astrology, upon which Benjamin lavishes such keen-eyed interest in his contrast with astronomy. These trickier, non-one-to-one -one mimesis are practices concerned with prediction, divination. Nevertheless, they bear on my practice and passion here in these pages, which is with writing, which is with writing, and not just with writing, but with a writing in which the things written about enter into the writing itself. Practice and passion here in these pages with a writing in which the things written can summon what it refers to into itself. It is as if the writing can summon what it refers to into itself. On this view, writing is not about something, but is that something? It is not a label. It is a call, just as the cry of the donkey is a call. The cry of the donkey holds me to this. It is the cry that leaps off the page as blindfold children try to pin the tail back on the donkey, and we laugh at the anatomical dislocations, two sides of the one coin, the cry that erupts, and the tail hanging forlornly off the donkey's nose, all left floating in midair amid the raucous laughter of the onlookers. Cacophony all around, mimesis unhinged. Let the animals loose. Cut up, Burroughs and Gason. It makes you wonder if the donkey has been selected through millennia as the great mimetic toy, nowhere more so than in the milieu of the adult's imagination of the child's. Benjamin's concept of nonsensual similarities presumes the notion that language is a net to be found everywhere, like a fact of nature. 
Hence the following electrifying <laughs> statement where the young Benjamin writes in 1916 that, quote, there is no event or thing in either animate or inanimate nature that does not in some way partake of language. For it is in the nature of all to communicate their mental meanings. At one point, in all earnestness, he asks, to whom is the language of the lamp directed? To the fox? To the mountain? And if this is not enough, as if it is not more than engaged with the animal language tree nexus to which my text is beholden, what of Benjamin's next step, namely his invocation of magic, claiming that mediation, meaning the, quote, immediacy of all mental communication, is the fundamental problem of linguistic theory and that this immediacy can be called, he says, magic. Small wonder he concludes by saying, the primary problem of language is magic. However, as he became caught up in Marxist ideas after reading George Lukacs' essay on the fetish quality of the commodity in 1924 on the island of Capri, Benjamin changed his position to one that kept juggling the aforesaid magic of the language of things with the magic of commodities. Now the lamp speaks differently to the fox, to the mountain, and to man. More bracing still are the insights into Benjamin's language of things essay, which I just quoted from, the, provided by documentary filmmaker Hito Sterl, Sterl in 2006. She advocates a filmmaking that amounts precisely to Benjamin's view of the language of things. Especially now, she says, in a globalizing commodity world, exactly where our oil palm is situated. Benjamin, I think, would have been delighted. A feature film tells a story. A documentary is more inclined to follow the language of things through imagery, especially by means of non sensuous correspondences. After all, capitalism does this effortlessly via your credit card, for instance. It is one thing for Roland Barthes in 1975 to elicit the strangeness of trees pulling linguistic stunts. He, 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 has a, uh, uh, he has a piece on, on, on palm trees in his uh, 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 Roland Bart by Roland Bart. He has a whole page on what he says is the ancient Greek belief that trees form alphabets. And of all the trees, the palm tree is, does this uh, mo most well. But today, this is the new normal. Recirculating fairy tale worlds in which things speak to things, like in an enchanted forest. The stupendous forces of marketing, especially its visual imagery, persistently co-op Benjamin's language of things, allowing the capitalist public sphere to swamp all other circuits of translation. This is potentially the case, this is pointedly the case, with palm oil and the oil palm. Is not palm oil the metamorphic sublime? That thing from which all other things are made? And surely this very, including diesel uh, fuel, and surely this very sublimity is what makes my task here both necessary and easier. The task, that is, of tracing circuits of correspondences, of nonsensuous correspondences in which the things written about enter into the writing itself. In which the things written about enter into the writing itself. As for capitalist circu circuitry, is this not a gift to a certain class of documentary filmmaker, anxious and excited by the possibility of eliciting an alternate world through an alternate web of things that are not so much things or thingly things 
as they are nodes in webs of translation that allow for the co-optation, so to speak, of the co-optation provided by the commodity form. Can we outpalm the metamorphic sublime of the palm, seeing that we have such an abundance of mimesis by which things talk to other things? First, the magic box of tricks supplied by the capitalist commodity form, and second, the Faustian, Dr. Faustus, the Faustian chemistry of palm oil itself. The challenge for such a filmmaker, like the mimetologically inclined anthropologist, is to figure out a way of talking with things via nonsensuous mimetic correspondences. Here is a photo of my hostess, Donya Edit, and following that, a plan I made of her house. I wrote a 22-page, single-spaced description of the house following this, this plan, like tracing a spiral shell clockwise. I will give you an example just of the first two items. There are about 17 items. Number one, a blue four-wheel drive car like a museum piece that never moves, at least not while I was there. Here people travel by foot, donkey, mule, or the launch that passes once a day except Sundays. Along with three bodyguards, the car was donated by the national government in 2012 for security to Miss A.L. as president of the Villagers Association that was created in 1998 and to which roughly 30, 40 percent of the villagers belong. I could never get the exact figure and it kept changing. Miss Ayel's bodyguard, Pedro, is, a, is from the village, a sweet-tempered, jovial fellow, a little uh, plump and out of shape with what I think was a pistol bulge under his shirt. At times he wears a bulletproof vest. It was a little unsettling, isolated in the forest in this tiny village, of 144 houses to think that at any time there could be an attack. The thought disappeared as soon as it occurred. It seemed too unreal, what with Pedro smiling all the time. I would see him placing, uh, playing with his nephew and niece, six months old twins, in the house opposite, shaking a rattle. When I asked him, when I ask him, he does not know their names. He did a course in bodyguarding in Bogota, which is a common thing to do these days. He always wanted to be a bodyguard. Sometimes I think there will be a bodyguard for everyone in Colombia, and then bodyguards for the bodyguards. After all, it is a society, like most, encrusted in the ethos of slavery and of maids meant to care for your every need. The bodyguard is simply the most recent version, like an extra soul and shadow they be, at least when employed by the rich in the city, slipping out to get you a cigarette when needed, lighting it for you, always in the big black SUV behind or standing nonchalant at the doorway to the restaurant with their six cents hooked up to the stars. A mix of babysitter, a savant, and killer of killers. But here in this remote village, the role is a lot less noir. I was surprised at a certain theatricality, as when in a time of danger, Pedro and his colleagues would suddenly appear in their smart, bulletproof vests, ribbed black like the armoring of a cockroaches, and sport a heavy, ornate badge, silver and blue, on their chest, like some super FBI agent along with a deadly efficient looking pistol in a webbed holster on the hip. But it was the badge that spoke most to me, the badge of officialdom that in its being phony, in, in its mimetic prowess, and in its being absolutely splendid, said more about the state and stately being than all the philosophers and lawyers ever did. Two, the second item. Somewhere there. I guess to the right of the blue car. Two, the braying of the donkey, which turns the world inside out. E -o, e -o. About which much more later. 
My drawing of Donya Edith's house, together with my baroquely detailed 22-page verbal descriptions of its contents, one by one, spiraling clockwise, like tracing a shell, is an instance, I think, of a swathe of mimesis, as things morph into other things, endlessly it can seem. You can think of this drawing, plus its associated verbal list of things, as my equivalent, my equivalent to palm oil processing, to a pro processing plant from which a mighty abundance of products come. Products meaning swathes of mimesis from diesel fuel to kids paints and crayons, plus the basis of what you purchase, basis of much of what you purchase in today's supermarket, that new forest of symbols. There are thingly things and not so thingly things running together here, running like Barrow's animals. There is the never driven blue car next to the orange tractor with its tires shut out machetes and gourd trees in the courtyard, etc., etc. But then the blue car hauls in Pedro. The blue car converts into Pedro the bodyguard, and therein lies a tale. In fact, several tales, and not only about Pedro, but about bodyguards in Colombia, and so forth, and so forth. Ovid fits right in. You can think of this spiral shell tracing in at least four ways. Uh-oh. Another list, because there was a huge list of that 22 single space pages going through this. You can think of this spiral shell tracing in at least four ways, okay? First, as arrant positivism, one damn fact after another, bearing in mind, however, Adorno's stricture of the first draft of Benjamin's Baudelaire, Paris capital of the 19th century essay, as involving a method, he said, he accused Benjamin, a method lying at the crossroads between positivism and magic. What was anathema to Adorno, however, I take to be valuable. I think we all need to sit at these crossroads, like the trickster, if only because you have no other choice, no matter how many negative dialectics you negate. The second way you can think of this spiral uh, shell tracing and its list is that it is close to, if not the same, as Benjamin's nonsensuous similarities. The third is as a denk build or thought image foray into ethnographic realism, or is it ethnographic surrealism? the image element of which is not only the actual drawing of Donya Edith's house, but the pictures in the mind of the thingly things enumerated. And fourth, you can think of this exercise as the ethnographer in search of a method, of a way of responding to the question, to the question, our perennial question, how best to get across a sense of people, place, and history, which in this case will help change history. Thus the corollary, quote, only if, the document, only if documentary forms translate the incongruities, writes Hito Sterl, and I continue quoting, the inequalities, the rapid change of speed, the disarticulation and dizzying rhythms, the dislocation and the arrhythmic pulsations of time, if they mortify the vital drives of matter and deaden them by impressiveness, will they engage with the contemporary community of matter?" End of quote. And you ask, what is the aim and end point of such an exercise? Sterl puts it well, I think, quote, by reflecting on the conditions of production in which this documentary translation is being achieved, new forms of a national, non nationalistic public spheres and post capitalist production circuits might emerge. End of quote. An esoteric aside, 13 years after his theological essay on the language of things, we find Benjamin warning against the occult, advising the reader as to the need for a what he called a dialectic optic, which sees the everyday as impenetrable and vice versa, the impenetrable as everyday. 
all in the name of the overarching concept of profane illumination, which meshes the theological with the material, the illumination with the profane. Or in our terms, it meshes, meshes, profane illumination, God with the donkey. Is not the donkey the epitome of the profane? But what of the illumination of the profane illumination? It certainly suggests theology, but does it not also indicate the sonic delirium of the cry of the donkey opening up swaths of mimesis? For is not profanation itself sacred? Is not the donkey on which the Messiah enters the holy city a profane illumination, or at least an indispensable part thereof? As to the magic of language, is the donkey the Antichrist challenging God who created the world through the word? Is this why the donkey is held to be the very quintessence of stupidity, another word for which is dumb, which means not only stupid but without speech? In that 1916 essay on language of Benjamin's that I have cited, he works through Genesis in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. He works through this in order to pick up on what I will call stage two of the making of the world of Genesis, which is when God breathes life into clay, the clay that is mankind, and thus provides humans with the gift of language, freed of God. And I take this from Benjamin's analysis. Is the donkey's cry the memory of that moment, liberating language from God? And is this action repeated by William Burroughs as Antichrist, cutting the pages, letting the animals out? Does this account for the eviscerating alienation effect of the cry of the donkey, that equine Antichrist? After all, the representation of the devil as an ass is not only very old and disturbing, but is what brings a mighty non-sensuous correspondence into focus, namely the correspondence between the equine ass and the human backside, also known in English, at least, as the ass, and American English as ass. Indeed, kissing the donkey's ass is part of European folklore concerning the cult of satanic witchcraft. Now, there's a mimesis. And let us not forget the common story that men in the swamplands from which I write in northern Colombia are said to have sexual intercourse with donkeys. All this raises the question as to whether Benjamin adhered too strongly to a visual understanding of the mimetic faculty at the expense of the bodily visceral aspect. Another esoteric aside, in any event, the perception of similarities, consciously or unconsciously, is what underlies the relays and swaths of mimesis in my search for a mode of writing that links the writing with what the writing is about. Fascinating and significant here is Benjamin's claim that the recognition of the similarities he has in mind is fleeting. It surfaces as the, the surface of a flash only to disappear. It flits past, can possibly be one again, but cannot really be held fast, as can other perceptions, end of quote. This applies with special force to play, to the play of the mimetic faculty in writing and reading. As for the magic of mimesis, it is this magic that makes mimesis thrilling without us quite knowing why. A joy which invokes play as with the play of children and also our adult understanding of play as experimenting with reality and investigating it. With the braying of the donkey, this sensibility opens 
like a fan. Then the bodily unconscious takes fire. Quote, people's habits are continually disturbed by things which trouble the calm ordering of life, write Hubert and Maus in their book on magic. Drought, wealth, illness, war, meteors, stones with special shapes, abnormal individuals, etc. At each shock, at each perception of the unusual, society hesitates, searches, waits. These shocks, they say, turn the abnormal into manna, M-A-N-A. -A. As regards shocks, not only meteors and droughts, but surely, surely, the paramilitaries and the oil palm, they advance. Does this mean I am connecting, if not equating, the expansion of oil palm plantations with the braying of the donkey? Is that a non-sensuous correspondence, an assemblage held together with sticky mimetic glue that shakes the world as it compresses at midnight outside the window? This channels us into surrealism, especially because it seems to me that Walter Benjamin folded manner into his observation in his essay on surrealism that, quote, we penetrate the mystery only to the degree that we recognize it in the everyday world. That patron saint of surrealism, the young Comte de Lautriamont, put it well in his epic poem, Maldoror, published in 1868, when, on hearing do dogs howling at the moon, the narrator's mother tells him, when you are in bed, and hear the barking of dogs in the countryside. Hide beneath your blanket, but do not deride what they do. They have an insatiable thirst for the infinite, as you and I and all other pale, long-faced human beings do. Dogs howling at the moon, evoking the infinite for us humans, via the wisdom of the mother. It hangs together so strangely, you feel the hairs on the back of your neck rising in parallel to the cry of the donkey, while I hide beneath my blanket. The surreal sound morphs into the surreal visual image, and the surreal visual image cascades into swaths of mimesis reminiscent of the sorcerer singing the song of the whitefish learned from stones that walk as the tides wax and wane along with the moon. And you ask yourself, how do we read the mother saying, when you are in bed, etc.? Do we read it for substance or for tone? Do we read it for content? Certainly. But what floods over us is its tone. This is what I take to be mana. And as such, as mana, it is of a piece with Maldoror's continuous evocation of extraordinary animal worlds engaging with my text through the intensity with which Maldoror explores what Benjamin, in explicit reference to Maldoror in his essay on surrealism, calls the cult of evil. I read Maldoror shuddering. It is his lip-smacking love of evil which does this. But also, I insist, it is his writing, the poet's ear, so fluid with resonance, yet so unexpected, something much more than a poetry of aggression combined with the swallowing of time, which is how Gaston Bachelard puts it in his study of Lautremont. In Benjamin's interpretation, this evil is in harness with Dostoevsky and Rimbaud, in seeing God as creating evil. Evil comes from God, not from willful human volition only. Seeing God as creating evil and thus providing for Europe, says Benjamin, thanks to the surrealists, what Benjamin 
then considered a radical sense of freedom. Distinct to what he calls liberal humanism, for Benjamin, this radical sense of freedom is tied to impulsions of the bodily unconscious, opening up the image sphere, the sphere in a word in which, as he says, political materialism and physical nature share the inner person. Repeatedly, Benjamin emphasizes this interpretation of body with image, collective body with image, as a profane illumination, one that predisposes, he says in 1928, to revolutionary discharge. Maldoror, to me, is a manner machine because of its writing engaging with what the writing is about. This is more than an expression of manner. It creates manner. In reacting to shock and in, and in converting shock into manner, more is made. In his introduction to his translation of Maldoro, Paul Knight, K-N-I-G-H-T, writes that, quote, the reader, far from being borne effortlessly along to the next point in the narrative, is shocked into awareness of the process taking place on the page before him. What is this process? It is the ultimate turn of the screw of realism, which is to say, mimesis, when the writing becomes increasingly inward looking, when the process of writing itself becomes the subject of fiction. As a capstone, let us acknowledge that the name Lotriamont is itself not only a disguise or a pen name, it is in itself mimetic magic at war with the state and literature. It is a mask for the author, the young Isidore Ducasse, 1846 to 1868, died very young. It is a mask for the young Isidore Ducasse who combined in himself the criminal wanted by the police and the author defying literary convention. The eminent sociologist from northern Colombia, Orlando Falsborda, informs us in his three-volume work on this region that generally speak, that's the Sur de Bolivar, northern Colombia swamps, good for palm oil, uh, informs us that generally speaking, Sexual, human sexual liaisons are fluid and open, heteronormatively at least. He doesn't say that, I say that. And that this not only lends itself, this fluidity, he thinks, to anti-authoritarian attitudes, but to sexual in intercourse of men with female donkeys as a way of being initiated into sex. Bureo, they call this. And one informant tells him that the difference is that we are frank enough to admit this, while in other parts of Colombia, hypocrisy reigns. I'm also informed by a young anthropologist, woman anthropologist, that in the Guajira Peninsula, north of here, it is said that men sexually mount female donkeys so as to enlarge the penis, or at least that is a side effect. In his memoir, Eminent Maricones, Eminent Gays, published in 1999, Juan Manrique, Colombian, writes of his time as an adolescent spent in the vicinity of El, the town of El Banco with his cousins who lived there, quote, fucking all the animals in sight, sight, chicken, pigs, and above all the female donkeys, end of quote. Later, he suffered what he describes as a terrible infection of his testicles that I had caught probably while fucking donkeys with Uncle Hernan. El Banco is about four hours downstream from Doña Edith's home. In the village, I was told that actually the donkey is a relative newcomer that get, got instituted here in the 1960s once the cattle bought by the rich cattlemen, I call them, uh, there's some terminological things I'll explain in question time but rather than clutter up the text right now. That when the, when the, the, uh, once the cattle brought by cattlemen hyphen drug men firmed up the ground. I really don't understand this too well, but in any event, 
Burros weren't of much use in the early days. They got stuck in the mud of the swamps. Their hooves are the same as horses and mules, not cloven like the devil and cattle. And in the early days, jaguars would eat them. Now there's an image for you, almost on the same scale as Andre Breton's image, or is it a concept of the, quote, fixed explosive, the image of which for him was a locomotive abandoned in the forest. Breton's idea of convulsive beauty fits in here too with the image of the beautiful burro, so gentle, so sweet in appearance, rearing and screaming as the jaguar lunges with its stripes through the dappled light of the forest. Perhaps like me, the jaguar found that brain unsettling, scooting along the plane of imminence. Is it because of the memories of those days that burros cry so much, even though there are no jaguars anymore? But they seem happy enough, these burros, at least during the day, trotting along the street all on their own, without any obvious human being leading them, making drum-like music, with plastic canisters bouncing up and down on their wooden frame saddles. Once or twice I saw a pair in full flight down the street, midday, as if racing each other, swerving from side to side, quite mad. Autonomous beings with a mind of their own, slaves to man and history, crazy and photogenic. Photogenic? That's strange. Most every middle-class person with whom I discuss the matter agree that donkeys are ravishingly cute. <laughs> so here's the question, here's the Bataillon question, my final question. How can a being, how can a being be considered so cute and so dumb and so willful and so aligned with witches, Satan, the human backside, and Christ's birth. Here's the baton question, my final question. How can a being be considered at one and the same time cute, dumb, willful, and aligned with witches, Satan, the human backside, and Christ's birth, and his entrance into Jerusalem? Is it because donkeys are considered the ultimate beast of burden? that they are so beautiful? Is it because they are so beautiful that their cry unhinges being itself, allowing the mimetic faculty full flood? Is this yet another instance of what Hegel was getting at with, with his parable of lordship and bondage? Thank you. Thanks for uh, <clears throat> such an excessive talk. I wish I could. <laughs> wish I could. Where's this? Uh, it comes out here. Should I lean in a bit yeah. more? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I, I can hear better here. No, it's not. It's somewhere invisible. All right. I'll just shout at He's you. He's only yeah. five feet from me. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the beginning of the talk, you've got the two uh, sort of economies of mimesis going. Um, well, I took some notes so I wouldn't forget yeah. all of this. There was a lot going on. Um, yeah, it's probably pretty confusing. <laughs> yes, I'm getting confused as I'm standing here. Um, one is the, uh, the sort of um, the mode of writing which you tied to Toulouse and Guattari and I take as a uh, tied in with territoriality also, which is the donkey's bray. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, a sort of base materialism, it's inscriptive, it's um, this excrescence and uh, about excess and the, you know, the palm oil, the internals of the palm oil being externalized and circulated and you had all this stuff about regurgitation and reflux, which I thought was all wonderful. And then you have the bodyguard also, which is... The body what? The bodyguard, which I think is a similar kind of... Thing. And then, and then there's this. Uh, the, there's a quote from Benjamin that you used that seemed to do something else, which was um, to rely on a kind of self, like uh, communication as self-expression, which was a, 
a confusing and disappointing turn at that moment, and then you came back to the sort of other one. And I, and I, I was thinking the other way to pose this question is, when, the, when the, uh, the men go out and fuck the donkeys, do the donkeys the next day mimic the men and, and mount them and fuck back? Oh, That's, you could go on and on, right? Right, yeah. yeah. Um, That's your question. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Just to be clear. Um, why not? Um, I want to uh, retain something of the magic or, or mis mystique of uh, mimesis, which is in imitating something, the imitator gathers some, some of the power and properties of that which is being imitated. And at the same time, uh, I want to follow this nonsensuous correspondences, which is not like the windmill, but is mediated with one thing connected to another, connected to another, connected to another, chains of mimesis. And this is, uh, I, I would suggest just relax and sort of accept that uh, uh, as a sort of jazzed up um, facticity, jazzed up chain of connections you might like, and we're comfortable with that. They could be thought of as facts, they could be thought of as things. Uh, that are connected loosely or tightly with one another, but I want to retain some of this uh, uh, mystique, power, properties of, of what I see as uh, understand and as, as mimesis. Um, I, at the same time, I want to allow these uh, formulations um, uh, interrogate, uh, shed light on what could be met by uh, could be meant by uh, the mimesis and the mimetic faculty. Uh, I, I have allowed this to expand beyond the human, uh, which is, as you know, is very uh, 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 fashionable in, in, in philosophical or semi-philosophical, social philosophical circles. Uh, Bruno Latour, etc., cetera, Viveros de Castro, and, and so forth and so on, for years now, de de maybe two decades, been looking for a way in which it doesn't seem crazy to say that things like trees and animals uh, can be put on somewhat the same plane as a the, as the human uh, being. The ultimate challenge, of course, uh, would be uh, human speech itself, which was fine by Benjamin, the young Benjamin, in that, in that difficult, not all that difficult essay, 1916 essay, uh, on the language of things and language as such. What is beautiful to me was to come across this Japanese-German film documentary maker, Hito Sterl, uh, who's a film theorist and filmmaker, and who's spoken here at the New School several times, I see from looking at YouTube. She's, I find her work astonishingly uh, uh, stimulating, um, where she says, hey, no one would do it. You know, no one has ever looked at this essay, so to speak, language of things and language as such. And she says, this is what I do as a documentary filmmaker. And she... Uh, uh, connects that with uh, global capitalism uh, and commodity exchange and so forth and, 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 and so on. Uh, that's grist to my mill because of uh, the economic uh, um, uh, circuits that palm oil is engaged upon and what clearing northern Colombia of people and destroying the swamps and destroying the animals and what's happening in the Chocó, which is just to the east, but below Panama, uh, in northern Colombia. Uh, there's, there's a sort of low intensity but deadly war going on there since quite a while, runs hot and cold, in which paramilitaries are clearing uh, villages in order to make way for this palm oil. So the green diesel fuel that the European Union uh, is, is buying. It may be green in one sense, but it's not green uh, in, a, in any other way. Uh, I, I referred to, I'm, uh, so I'm moving a little bit from answering your question in a more philosophical or linguistic way to give you a bit, a bit more of content. I, I found that uh, I wanted to engage uh, with, a, with a reality in which humans, animals, rivers, swamps, uh, 
palm oil and donkeys, etc., etc., uh, could be put on, if you like, the one plane. At one point, I called it a plane of imminence following Deleuze. I had my own uh, w wordage for that. Uh, significant here, I think, uh, and in a way alarmingly convenient, is the fact that palm oil has, with modern chemistry, has this uh, incredible capacity to make so much stuff. Uh, is it a tribute to palm oil? Is it a tribute to the chemists? Well, both. Uh, but it's palm oil that they choose. It's palm oil that they work with. Like, it's like a fairy tale. It's, uh, it's something that you uh, have to wonder at. So it's like a, a convenient uh, uh, figure, you know, like as in figure of speech, as in a literary figure. It's a convenient figure for me to uh, uh, bring a lot of this idea of swaths of mimesis, I call it. So uh, I'm trying to have my cake and eat it. I'm trying to uh, say these connections exist. For example, as in this, uh, as I tried to uh, give you just the briefest taste of all the connections in that uh, uh, diagram, but more than the connections in the diagram, which you can think of in all sorts of ways, right? You could say. Well, history, life history, how this thing got to be there, how that other thing got to be there, how these other things disappeared. That's our more conventional, comfortable way of talking about things in a household, right? Well, I, I chose this other way. And partly the other way consists of putting words to those things, strangely enough, in a sort of order, a, a clockwise spiraling order. Uh, uh, and then I... Call these, what I'm putting on the page is giving um, voice to uh, mimetic connectedness, nonsensuous correspondence. So I find Benjamin's what I call dodgy move to like contain mimesis, still have his mimesis, but he said, well, I know it doesn't quite fit. I mean, most, most connections are not iconic like that, or whatever the term is, indexical, iconic, etc. Uh, but he has his. Uh, he has his uh, he he's has some uh, persuasive power there, as far as I'm concerned. Um, w w one of the things I want to stress is uh, all of us want to know more about the real world uh, and prioritize certain things, uh, but all of us are not quite so quick to raise the question, how do you describe reality? Well, we have certain conventions, uh, and uh, they have problems. Uh, and as ethnographers trying to write about a social world, a village in a moment in history here, um, you're faced with this difficulty of putting the reality into, into a description, putting the reality into words. And what I've done here, and not merely my talk, is come up with one of, I guess, almost an infinite number, or certainly a very large number of ways of uh, describing the real. Uh, I've never seen anybody do it this way in anthropology. Uh, I found it sort of convenient. Rather than take you by the hand and through the village like this, I thought, you know, it's interesting. Do, do a diagram, crude as it may be, and then list it in the most um, nerdy way. <laughs> number one, number two, number three, number four. Try it out. Quite lengthy descriptions. You, I read you out one. Pedro the bodyguard, the blue car. I don't know if, uh, uh, what, re what reception it will get, but it, it pleased me. And I thought this is a very economical way of getting an amazing amount of both pertinent and fascinating stuff across. Maybe it becomes fascinating because of the way it's done. I don't know. So this would be... Um, an attempt to use what I think of as uh, uh, referring to mimesis as um, uh, engaged with the problem, the very bread and butter uh, craft problem of describing uh, reality. So I don't know if all that 
uh, helps at all. I hope it does. Uh, you saw certain sorts of contradictions. I'm sure there are. Uh, I'm sure there are. You'd also, I think, have to um, uh, pay some credence to the um, spasmodic or interrupted nature of the talk itself. Um, and uh, the way I sort of signaled the distinctions uh, between the different motifs. They connect it, but they're also separate. And that might in itself, the very form of um, presentation, might uh, be isomorphic with uh, the non idea of nonsensuous correspondences. You might say to yourself, well, what's the whole point of that? And it's again, I'm trying to say, the thrill and the power of mimesis is is maintained uh, through this uh, form of expression. Sorry. So since you uh, uh, mentioned Bruno Latour, I was curious about his mode of description that he uses, which I think is quite similar to how you had uh, gone through and listed all of these things. But in Latour's uh, mode of describing, he wants critique to be completely outside of it or he doesn't even want it involved. So I was wondering how do you incorporate critique when you go through and describe uh, these various things, or do you describe the reality and then have critique sort of on the side, or what role does critique play in this? Thank you. Uh, and thank you, the first questioner. Um, uh, the, uh, to me, the critique is uh, so-called imminent in the description. I don't have description and then a critique outside of it. And I think, uh, if you think of the sense of irony uh, alone uh, in, 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 uh, in what I read, uh, a certain lightheartedness, maybe, changes of pace, uh, high theory and uh, baseness of reality, sort of mixed up, sort of mixed up, I, that might be um, a, a fair illustration of what I would like to think of as the critique is in the, in the description. This would be a very important question that, uh, uh, you know, in terms of what we grapple with, which is writing ethnography. I don't have the facts and then the critique. They're mixed up and it, it becomes a sort of um, playful and deadly serious uh, operation. Uh, you must be aware uh, of what I'm getting at, right? Yeah, so it's part of the deal. It's, it's part of the uh, material. Uh, it's part of the page. The, the distinctions between description and, and, uh, and critique tend to be uh, on, the same, on the same page. Now, as I say that, I realize that this is meant to be descriptive, but it isn't like it's followed by then critique. Other other paragraphs will do that sort of work. And even in the 22 pages, single-spaced, of going around that, you'll start to see, look, 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 look take number one, Pedro the bodyguard. You take the, the reference to the car's never been moved. The red tractor behind it has its tires blown out by paramilitaries. Um, Pedro the bodyguard, that disquisition on, on bodyguards, what, what does bodyguard suggest, amount to, history? of, and so forth, the big shining badge, and all that sort of stuff. That seems to me both descriptive and um, you just raise your eyebrow as you're describing it, put it that way. And uh, this is part of an almost 300-page book without any chapters. It goes uh, uh, numbered uh, uh, pages or paragraphs, so it's not as if there's critique at the end. But you hear the voice. And the voice is going to do that uh, work of, of critique. Is, is that uh, satisfying? Uh, I mean, is that as an, exp as an attempt to answer your question? It's OK. I mean, I find it enormously important. Yeah. Well, but in a way, you're arguing that the critique is in the form, the, as well as the content. It's in the right. very form. Yeah. I wanted to ask maybe an, an unfair kind of question. I don't know if we need David up here as well. But there is a quality in which um, capital 
is value in motion here. And where the palm oil actually is this constant transformation of the forms and then the things that slough off that are kind of an anti-value, David, that they don't actually, they, they die in, in this circulating thing that, I mean, both of you have offered us something that is in constant transformation of itself. Is that, does that? Yeah. I mean, there'll be moments or phases of, of uh, what might call stagnation, uh, which will be the consolidation of the palm oil plantation economy. But what would come next? Uh, but if, if it was all centered on the palm oil itself as this motion, this value in motion, would that have altered this or would that have distorted it for you if the palm oil was well, more central? I mean, who knows how long this household will stay like that? Right. I mean, given the rate they're going at. Uh, but it, it's, it's, there's, there's plenty of resistance and cl very clever resistance as well as very clever forces of, um, well, I don't know, call it global capital. I mean, they obviously have the money and the upper hand, but it's, it's not 100% sure that they will get all that they uh, are after. That's the friction, uh, the slack in that motion. The motion is not perfect that you talk about, I guess. Um, there are other forces at work here you might think about. These people who live here are what are called co uh, colonists. When we think of the term colonists, we think of someone very rich and very powerful. But in, uh, say, Latin America, colonist generally means a poor peasant, landless person who goes into the um, frontier and tries to make a living by cutting the tr trees. Yes, cutting the trees, uh, killing the animals for their pelts, and so on. And uh, and fishing. Well, how long, this is on an island, a big island, but how long would the island last anyway uh, with that sort of uh, extractive economy by the poor? It's not the extractive economy of Exxon Oil or something. So this is another type of circuit that you would want to consider, and I could go on and on. Uh, Please. Hello. Um, thank you so much. Do you mind um, if I come? <laughs> sure, I sure. Can <laughs> Um, I was so struck when you were describing the donkey as a piece of burden who plays all these sort of sy symbolic roles, including... Um, so you have to say, oh, sorry, um, the, the donkey, um, the symbolic role of the donkey as this piece of burden um, when you're describing all of its kind of various manifestations, including... Oh, um, it's right? Absolutely, and, and I, was, I was so curious, especially when you're mentioning um, the donkey as sort of the, the, the beast that Jesus wrote into Jerusalem and, and his association with, with Christ. Um, I was also curious uh, what you would do with the, uh, the Old Testament account of Balaam's donkeys talking. The Old Testament. Um, uh, account of Balaam's donkey um, giving, having, having voice to speak when... Tell me, tell oh. me the story. Oh, sorry, okay. I'm so dumb um, on the Bible. No, no, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I don't remember very well, but I think in, in Judges somewhere, um, uh, Balaam, I think, is someone, I think is a prophet ordered to speak on behalf of, uh, of God to the Israelites who were sitting in one form or the other, I forget exactly why, um, but um, he's riding on a donkey to, to go along on this journey and I think he's ambivalent about it and he decides maybe either at the last minute or already on the journey he's deciding not to go in the direction that God's told him, but the donkey, I think um, an angel on the road blocks the donkey from, from proceeding um, and then eventually um, turns the donkey in, in the right direction. Um, and so the, I, I believe Balaam, Balaam beats the donkey into submission um, until finally the donkey uh, can't take it anymore and somehow is given divine power to speak back. Um, and so Balaam- Actually speaks. He actually speaks. So I was curious well, what you I've would- definitely got to check oh, this out. <laughs> but I was curious how you would read that account. <laughs> um, look, those of you who are, uh, who are human <laughs> and think about justice and all of that, and Marx and Hegel, I mean, I think there is something really powerful in the way in which one of the animals that is considered so stupid and, and is a brute carrying heavy loads and features so strongly in the Mediterranean and other, in Latin America, uh, uh, has these uh, fan of associations 
in which its cry, you know, is like riveting. And I maintain it's so beautiful. And that's why I brought in Hegel's master slave, Lordship and Bondage, famous and famously difficult chapter that the, the, the force below, in a sense, conquers the Lord. Well, conquer maybe not, but the beauty is one thing that strikes me as incredibly uh, important in this uh, subservience of the brute animal, the animal of labor. Uh, and, and secondly, this fan of associations, which are very striking. You know, pro-Christ, anti-Christ, and the sexuality of it all, I you know, haven't gone into any further than those descriptions, and I'm no doubt uh, you know, a, a, a clever uh, uh, interpreter uh, could m do a lot with, with, those, um, with those facts. Uh, but I think that's really is um, the main one of the main points I'd like to get across with this little talk. Uh, you probably think it's strange that I, I give a talk which is so animal focused uh, about such a, a conflict or uh, uh, situation. Uh, but that's how it'd be. I think we were done. On that. <laughs>